Personally, I was holding the body of the commander-in-chief in my arms, and uh, the rest of the cortege was moving ahead as best they could. And it was a sad, sad journey. When we arrived in the city of Cork, there was consternation at my headquarters. We had uh, my doctor attached to my division was there, and he took charge of the body and brought it to the hospital. I thought it was to the, and I'm not quite sure which hospital it was now. I think it was the Mercy Hospital that he was taking, and the nuns there or, took care of him. <laughs> uh, I had to get in touch. I had to keep on running my unit. I had to get in touch with headquarters in Dublin. And uh, this took a roundabout route because I had to send, we were working on shortwave radios, which were contrived for us by a fellow named Dowling, whose father was registrar of the Royal College of Science, Ireland. And he was very competent. And we had these shortwave radios all the way. And we contacted, I had to get in touch with Waterville. And the message went from Waterville by cable to New York and back from New York to London, from London to Dublin. And that's how the message was received in Dublin. That's how they learned in Dublin that uh, the commander-in-chief was dead. You, right. Your own officers, of course, in Cork City uh, must have been appalled at the whole situation. What was, the, what was their mood? Their mood was very, very difficult for me to define because my own mood was very upset. <laughs> I was not uh, in a fit position to judge other people, really. I was completely grief-stricken. However, I got a call of an emergency call from the female barracks or prison that uh, some of my officers were up there trying to force an entrance. To and get at the irregular prisoners? I presume so. They were looking for some form of reprisal, I should think. So I went out there, and uh, after arguing at gunpoint with some of my friends, I, I argued them into reason, and they dispersed and went back to their units, and uh, a crisis was avoided. The following day was Wednesday, the 23rd of August, and it was decided to take the body back to Dublin by... We were ordered to take the body back by boat which was the method of transport anyhow at that time. And on the afternoon, the evening, we proceeded down to the Keys, and uh, the remains were taken on board, mounted on the after deck, I think. And uh, at uh, evening tide, we started our sorrowful journey down the river. There were tears all over, over the place. I mean, everybody was grief-stricken, including even the, the members of the crew and the members of, of, of the guard that were on doing honor to the chieftain. The boat proceeded very slowly down the River Lee. And when we were coming out into the harbor, I was surprised to notice that the British destroyer fleet was in line astern and dressed, the troop, their sailors dressed along. And we were greeted with a salute of trumpets, general salute. And this was fantastic over the waves, unbelievable. At any time, music is, is resounding over a big water space. And as we quietly went further on, they saluted, and then they sounded the last post. And I have that memory with me still. It always will be. It was something that is hard to describe. Uh, I was moved, and looking around the harbor, Queenstown Harbor, I noticed that all the windows all around had lights in them candles or some light of some description as a sort of a farewell tribute. 
it was a very emotional time. The body, after embalming by Oliver St. John Gogarty, was laid in state in Dublin City Hall. Thousands paid their last respects. Reminiscent of those which Dublin had witnessed for O'Connell, Parnell and Devoy, the remains were drawn on a gun carriage to Glasnevin Cemetery. I'd use no other word, hasn't altered one iota in the passage of time. He was a man whom I didn't know all that long, but whom I knew terribly well in a very short time. And uh, whereas I don't think he showed me any special favors, he was always very kind to me and very understanding. And he replaced, or seemed to place, a lot of trust in me and in my judgment. And this is a most rewarding feeling from someone whom you admire so much. A man of ability? A man of immense ability, untiring energy, and thoughtfulness for others. At the end of a day when most people would look for a rest, I've known him to go around looking for the relatives of people who have suffered a loss to try and give them some comfort. And this from a man who never had a free moment for himself. He was a patriot, a most courageous man, and a great, great gentleman. After the funeral, as civil...